Thank you for joining this episode of UAB Medicine's post-COVID Lunch and Learn series. Today, Dr. Gilbert Perry, Vice Director for Clinical Services in the Division of Cardiovascular Diseases, will be discussing post-COVID symptoms and the cardiovascular system. Please submit your questions in the Q&A, and if time allows at the end of Dr. Perry's presentation, he will try and answer as many questions as he can as, that relate to this Lunch and Learn. For those of you new to Zoom, you will find the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. I'll pass this over to Dr. Perry. Dr. Perry? Um, thank you for that introduction. So welcome to today's um, uh, seminar on uh, COVID symptoms in the cardiovascular um, system. Screen frozen. There we go. Um, <clears throat> So this is the second in a series of talks that um, <clears throat> will cover various symptoms that can develop um, after um, COVID. <clears throat> this afternoon, uh, we'll be talking about the cardiovascular system. So we'll, we'll start by an overview of how COVID-19, uh, the symptoms that develop with COVID-19, uh, talk a little bit about uh, different levels of severity of COVID-19 and what you can expect in terms of recovering from COVID-19. And then we'll focus specifically on how COVID-19 may affect the heart and how that may result in continuing symptoms uh, during the recovery phase. So what is uh, coronavirus? So coronavirus is a whole bunch of viruses that uh, commonly infect mammals and birds. Um, it uh, is a common uh, cause of the common cold that we all suffer every winter. Um, uh, coronaviruses can cause common cold. Uh, it's called the coronavirus because under the microscope, it looks like a crown or a corona. Uh, COVID-19 is the particular virus that caused the most recent epidemic um, that's caused all this trouble for the past uh, year and a half. And uh, another name for that is SARS-CoV-2 because this is the second coronavirus that has caused major respiratory diseases, the first one being back in 2002, 2003. So what, what symptoms uh, do we uh, see with um, acute COVID? Uh, the most common are headache, congestion, uh, fever is very common. Um, most patients who are symptomatic will have a fever at some point. Cough, sore throat is very common, flu-like illness. Uh, many patients have trouble with GI symptoms like nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Um, and uh, notoriously, many patients uh, lose their sense of taste and smell, which is often the first clue that they're sick. Um, so what I'd like to talk about next is um, the uh, recovery from, from acute COVID. Um, what is, and first of all, if we're gonna talk about this, we need to have some definitions is what is normal recovery and what is considered uh, so-called long haulers or post-COVID syndrome. There's no real firm definition uh, for this. Uh, a group in Europe, uh, the NICE group, has come up with a uh, set of definitions which are listed here. So in the first four weeks, that's considered the acute COVID phase. Um, uh, from four to 12 weeks is considered ongoing symptomatic COVID. And then long COVID or the post COVID is symptoms that persist beyond 12 weeks. So just like there's a whole uh, spectrum of severity of the initial presentation of COVID as is listed on the left, there's a wide spectrum of what pa how patients recover from COVID. So with the acute symptoms, it can range anything from being completely asymptomatic and just testing positive or never getting tested, um, or mild symptoms, perhaps a low-grade fever or cough for a few days, uh, moderate symptoms are patients who have um, breathing trouble, high-grade fever, symptoms that are lasting a week to 10 days, um, but aren't sick enough that they need to go in the hospital. Um, the, uh, so the asymptomatic, mild, and moderate groups uh, make up about 80% of people who get COVID, and somewhere around 20% are going to develop more serious illness that require hospitalization. So severe COVID is if you're in the hospital requiring oxygen therapy. Uh, on the general wards. And then critical COVID is if you are critically ill, have to go to the ICU. Uh, and of course, some of those patients develop multi-organ failure and, uh, and die. Now, uh, the recovery phase also is widely variable. So many patients either have no symptoms or rapidly recover within a week or two. 
Um, a fair number of symptoms, patients have symptoms that persist four to 12 weeks. And then there are the patients, as I said, who are long COVID lasting more than 12 weeks. Uh, if you start out with the milder degrees of COVID, you are less likely to develop long COVID or ongoing symptoms, but it's no guarantee. So I see plenty of patients in my clinic who had mild COVID or moderate COVID, never went to the hospital, and yet still are feeling bad more than 12 weeks later. What are the symptoms that uh, patients continue to have uh, after COVID? So the most common symptom, the thing that shows up in all the studies and in my clinic as well is fatigue. People just report that they tire easily, they can't do what they used to do. Uh, other common symptoms are trouble breathing, uh, in other words, getting short of breath with exertion, uh, chest pain, uh, especially in my clinic since it's a cardiology clinic, and cough are often also common symptoms. Uh, other symptoms that may persist after COVID is some people, it takes a fair amount of time to get back their sense of smell and taste. Uh, as a result, some people may have poor appetite. Some patients report joint and muscle pains, headaches, difficulty sleeping, not feeling refreshed after sleeping, uh, GI symptoms like nausea and diarrhea. Um, and then many patients have uh, uh, psychological or thinking trouble. So they'll be irritable, notice a change in mood, have difficulty concentrating, so-called brain fog. Um, and some patients may uh, have developed depression or post-traumatic stress type disorders. In terms of the timing of this, um, uh, hospitalized patients generally take longer to get back to a normal state than outpatients. Um, this is a list of, uh, 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 this is some of my experience with 50 patients that I saw in my COVID clinic. Um, between December last year and May of this year, uh, 10 men and 40 women, aged 22 to 80. 16 of those patients uh, were in the recovery phase four to 12 weeks after COVID and 34 were more than 12 weeks or in the low, long COVID phase. And as you might expect uh, with a cardiology clinic, um, uh, my clinic was weighted towards patients with cardiovascular symptoms. So they were short-winded. They had chest pain, uh, rapid heart rate and palpitations are very common uh, complaints. But even in my cardiology clinic, by far the most common complaint is fatigue. <clears throat> so this is just a across the spectrum of um, post-COVID symptoms. I think this is by far the most troubling and most common. <clears throat> in terms of how long it takes to recover from COVID, there's been a, a wide range of, of times in various studies. But again, patients who are hospitalized generally have at least the uh, four to 12 week uh, post-COVID symptoms much more commonly than those who are not hospitalized and generally take longer to recover. Um, there are three um, studies that have really looked at this uh, that I think give us some information about what you can expect. So the first study uh, listed on this slide, the University of Washington study, you may recall back uh, last spring, last year, that Washington was one of the first states to be affected. And so they had a lot of patients who were hospitalized. So these are 234 patients who were hospitalized with COVID. So they either had severe or critical COVID. And in that group of fairly sick patients, uh, almost one third of them still were having symptoms uh, 28 days later. And the typical symptoms were fatigue, loss of smell, and the so-called brain fog. Um, on the other hand, the second study listed here, the COVID symptom study, is a study out of Europe, mostly Great Britain, where young, younger, healthier patients um, who almost all uh, had outpatient COVID, so they had mild to moderate uh, COVID, uh, were given a phone app and then asked to report in weekly about whether their symptoms had gone away. So in that group of patients who, was, who were much less ill acutely, um, 13% of them reported that their symptoms lasted less than 28 days, so much less than in the University of Washington study. And actually, if you look at their data and follow it out to um, 12 weeks, only 2% of patients continued to have symptoms at 12 weeks, which is very reassuring for patients who have relatively mild disease and not a lot of underlying illness to begin with. Uh, those who did have persistent symptoms at 28 days or 12 weeks, again, fatigue, headache, shortness of breath, loss of smell or taste. Uh, perhaps the most comprehensive and least biased of these studies is the last one listed, the UK Office of National Statistics, which did a, a, 
a survey on a large number of patients, 20,000 patients or so. So as you know, in Great Britain, they have a national health system. They know everybody who's tested positive and they can do these kind of um, surveys. They found that uh, their results were sort of in between uh, the two previous studies we talked about. So 14% of those patients were still having symptoms at 12 weeks. Um, and the average recovery time was about 36 days. So um, many patients had symptoms for more than a month and 14% developed so-called long COVID. We're still experiencing some symptoms at 12 weeks. And again, the most common symptom was fatigue followed by cough, headache, and muscle pain. Um, the CDC also did a survey in this country and again showed that hospitalized patients take long, don't recover as quickly as outpatients. So in this study at 14 to 21 days, 40% of inpatients felt like they were back to their prior state of health as opposed to 60% of outpatients. So what does that mean for Alabama? Um, as of yesterday, when I went to Bama Tracker, it looks like over half a million people in the state uh, have had COVID-19 and recovered from it. Uh, if you take that number and multiply by about 13%, which is the number of percentage of patients who had long COVID in the British study, um, that would suggest that there may be as many as 70,000 people in the state who have symptoms that persist more than 12 weeks. So you can see that this really uh, is, is quite an important public health problem. So what, what are the questions uh, that uh, I get asked by physicians and uh, patients? Well, the main thing people want to know is, you know, I feel terrible. I was sick four weeks ago, 12 weeks ago and I still am tired, I can't exercise, my heart races every time I do stuff, my chest hurts, I'm short of breath, my heart's pounding, I'm dizzy. You know, what's wrong with me? Is this a heart problem? You know, people have heard that um, some famous athletes have been held out from sports because of heart issues. Is it possible I have a heart problem that's causing these symptoms that I have? So the first question is, well, uh, can COVID-19 cause heart problems? And we know that it can in the acute phase of illness. So if you look at patients who are in the hospital because of COVID-19, so these are sicker patients, moderate, uh, I'm sorry, severe or critically ill patients, uh, between 10 and 40% of those patients will have evidence of heart injury, um, uh, which means that there's been damage to some of the heart muscle cells. And the way we know this is we measure a protein in the bloodstream called troponin, which goes up when the heart is being injured. So depending on the population you look at and how sick they are when they're hospitalized de determines what percentage of patients are likely to have heart injury. Also, we know that patients who are um, older and have underlying heart um, problems are much more likely to have um, heart injury. Um, other heart problems may also occur, uh, particularly in the hospital. Uh, rhythm problems can occur with any critically ill patient and we certainly see them with COVID. It's probably not any more common with COVID than with other critical illnesses. Uh, rhythms can include atrial fibrillation and for very sick terminally ill patients, you can have cardiac arrest. Um, the other thing we've learned about COVID is it does make you more prone to have clots and this can cause strokes. Uh, it can cause a pulmonary embolism, which is when a clot goes to your lungs and it cause, can cause uh, heart attacks where clots form in the heart arteries. Um, the strokes and pulmonary embolism are particularly problematic because they sometimes occur as the first presenting symptom and they can occur in fairly young and healthy people. Um, heart failure, uh, which is a weak heart muscle, can occur uh, in hospitalized patients with COVID-19, either because of things like pulmonary embolism or heart attack, or sometimes just uh, when patients are critically ill, uh, this, the inflammation and stress of being sick can actually cause heart weakness. That problem is called stress cardiomyopathy and often uh, gets better as you recover from the acute illness. Um, <clears throat> fortunately, uh, a heart failure in the hospital is not a common problem. The other type of heart failure problem we see in the, heart, in the hospital, especially in critically ill patients, is the part of the heart that pumps to the lungs, the right ventricle, may dilate and fail. So that can be from a pulmonary embolism, it can be from severe COVID pneumonia. Um, and in autopsy series, uh, there is a fair amount of failure of the right ventricle that has been documented. 
So that's hospitalized patients. What about outpatients? As I told you earlier, 80% of us who get COVID end up not going to the hospital. So is there the possibility of a heart injury in those patients? As you can imagine, uh, we have a lot less data on that because outpatients aren't getting blood drawn. So we don't really know, for example, if they have an abnormal troponin. Uh, there are some populations that give us some information. So for example, uh, when the uh, uh, professional sports league started activity up again uh, last year, um, uh, they all had very uh, strict testing protocols where um, the players were getting tested uh, daily or near daily. And uh, so the data I show on this slide comes from uh, those studies of, of major league athletes. So this is major league ba baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, major league soccer all had a similar testing protocol and pooled their data. Um, so over a six month period between last May and October, uh, they found 789 patients who uh, tested positive for COVID. Of those only 30 on screening tests, which included an echocardiogram, that's an ultrasound of the heart, a troponin and an EKG, only 30 out of those 789 or 4% had any indication of a heart problem. Now, keep in mind, this is a very young, healthy population, and I think all of them or near all of them recuperated at home, so they weren't hospitalized. They either had mild or moderate or, in some cases, asymptomatic COVID. Um, after further testing of those 30 patients who were positive, only five of them were thought to have a, a severe enough problem that they, their return to play was postponed. So out of 789 professional athletes who tested positive for COVID, five of them or less than uh, about one half of 1% uh, ended, out, ended up being held out because of concern they might have ongoing um, myocardial or heart injury. Um, another study that looked at this in a similar population looked at college athletes. And uh, so uh, NCAA athletes, there were 3,000 of them who were uh, tested positive for uh, COVID-19. Um, uh, if you can see most of them again had asymptomatic or mild illness. The nice thing about this study is that uh, they stratified uh, what happened based on how severe the initial illness was. And also this study had both men and women uh, as opposed to the professional uh, leagues. So if you were asymptomatic or mild acute illness, I don't think you can even see the little red bar at the uh, bottom of that first column, but there were eight patients or basically uh, one half of 1% who had evidence of myocardial injury. Uh, so very, very uncommon in that group. Um, in uh, patients who had a little more severe acute illness, a moderate acute illness, so they had fe high fevers, were sick for several days, um, those patients, the likelihood of having heart injury was also small, but it was a little higher, about 2%, 2 out of 100. And finally, in, in patients, or not patients, but um, players um, or athletes who had acute cardiopulmonary syndromes, uh, so that would be they had chest pain or, or trouble breathing with the acute illness. Uh, there, again, most of them were, were okay, but a, a, a higher number did have evidence of heart injury. So 10% of that group had heart injury. So the overall, the overall take home is that, again, in a young, healthy population like this, myocardial injury is rare. Uh, uh, the authors uh, concluded that athletes with asymptomatic or mild illness might be able to return to sports without additional testing once they were uh, out from the acute illness and weren't having any symptoms. Um, but that, pay, that um, athletes with uh, moderate disease or with acute cardiopulmonary symptoms should have uh, consider screening with an echo and EKG and troponin. And then if one of those is abnormal, uh, MRI is the gold standard um, along with the troponin for detecting myocardial in injury or damage. So with this kind of protocol, there were no instances of sudden death or severe adverse events, either in the professional athletes or in the college athletes. So in summary, myocardial injury is another way of saying damage to the heart. Uh, it's common in hospitalized sicker patients with COVID-19. It's relatively uncommon in young healthy populations who are not hospitalized and do not have cardiopulmonary symptoms. And the big unknown is, well, how common is it in the average middle-aged person or older person who may have underlying heart disease, but did not get hospitalized. And honestly, 
we have very little data uh, to answer that question. It's probably somewhere in between the athletes and the hospitalized patients. So what are the long-term implications of this? Are these uh, uh, often mild elevations of troponin that we see? Uh, do they mean that you're gonna have heart trouble or be at risk in the long-term? Unfortunately, we really don't uh, have much information on this yet. This is an area of active interest in study. Um, we do, some studies do see subtle evidence of heart injury on MRI um, weeks or months after the initial COVID uh, attack. Uh, troponins are very rarely elevated that far out, but occasionally can be. However, both of these findings are not that uncommon in uh, middle-aged people or older people who have underlying heart problems. And in fact, uh, one study looked at a population post-COVID and compared it to similar patients who did not have COVID and actually found a similar uh, likelihood of having an abnormality by MRI in both populations. So how, how much COVID really causes long-term heart injury or risk is at this point not really well understood. Um, th this is the experience I've had so far in those 50 patients I mentioned previously. So uh, of those 50, uh, there were um, three men who were aged 39 to 47 who clearly had um, uh, abnorm abnormalities uh, of either heart functions, so the heart was a little weak, or elevation in the heart failure hormone called BNP, or elevation in troponin. Um, and then there were three women with uh, borderline findings on the ECHO study uh, where the heart looked slightly weak. Um, uh, many of these patients uh, subsequently underwent an MRI. And in the initial 50 that I'm showing here, uh, 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 many of those had a mild decrease in heart function, but nobody had uh, evidence of scar, uh, which is the most concerning thing that we might see on the MRI. Um, since I've made this slide. I have had one patient now referred to me who does show evidence of scar on the MRI. So it probably does happen, but again, uh, it's not that uncommon in middle-aged populations anyway. So the next question is, uh, well, who needs to be evaluated for this? Um, um, so certain kinds of symptoms, uh, I think, probably do warrant evaluation. So chest pain particularly is something that should be taken seriously. Um, there are many kinds of chest pains that may occur um, after COVID uh, or in general. Uh, many of the patients I've seen complain of chest pain, uh, chest wall pain. So their muscles are sore, their chest is sore. Um, so that's not usually a heart problem. But other patients may have chest pains that sound like heart problems may occur during exercise, uh, may get worse when you take a deep breath or cough, which sometimes can be uh, irritation of the lining around the heart, uh, something called pericarditis. So a chest pain usually needs evaluation, um, at least by your primary care doctor. Uh, other problems that may indicate a heart problem is difficulty breathing while exercising. Um, uh, usually this is a, a lung problem, particularly if you were hospitalized and have COVID pneumonia, uh, but sometimes this can be a heart problem as well. Uh, things that are less likely to represent a heart problem is if you have fatigue or muscle aches, uh, usually that's from not from a heart problem. Now, some of these syndromes may be a cardiovascular problem more generally, and we'll talk about that, but it's not usually a heart problem. Um, and then uh, a very common thing that I see uh, in the clinic, uh, maybe one of the most common complaints is that people just feel like their heart rate's racing, their heart's pounding, Maybe it feels like it's beating a little bit irregularly. Uh, most often after I've evaluated uh, these people, it's usually not a heart rhythm problem. Uh, it's usually something else, but uh, certainly it could be a heart rhythm problem in some patients. And particularly if it's happening in patients with chest pain or uh, difficulty with breathing, it, it would need to be investigated to make sure there's no heart rhythm problem. Um, more commonly, these things are caused either by deconditioning. So if you're sick in bed for two weeks and then you don't exercise because you're too tired to for the next month or two, that's going to cause your heart to beat fast when you try to do things. Um, also, there may be an abnormality of the autonomic nervous system that can develop, um, and we'll talk about that in just a second. So two syndromes that I think uh, there's some interest in as to whether they may cause some of these problems with exertion in patients 
who after we do an evaluation don't seem to have a heart problem, uh, which is most of them, right? So some patients have a heart problem, but the majority that we evaluate in the clinic do not have anything that we can find wrong with the heart. But there seems to be a problem with the overall control of the cardiovascular system. And there are a couple of things that have been reported in, in post-COVID. We don't really know at this point how common they are. Uh, one uh, syndrome that, uh, especially at Mount Sinai, has been reporting is something called uh, POTS, or Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome. So what does that mean? That means when you stand up, your heart rate increases uh, more than it should. It, which the definition is more than 30 beats a minute from when you're laying down, um, and that that happens without a fall in blood pressure. So this kind of thing has been reported um, after uh, many uh, life stressors, and uh, including uh, severe viral illnesses, and there's some suspicion that it may occur after COVID in some patients. It's more common in young women. Uh, young, young women who get this also seem to take longer to recover than men do. So symptoms with this may include feeling lightheaded, notice your heart racing when you stand up. Uh, some patients actually pass out when they're trying to exercise or stand up. And uh, many patients report difficulty exercising. Um, if if uh, you are, so, so we can test for this by having you lay down and check your heart rate and blood pressure. And then after you've been lying down for five minutes, you stand up and we check your heart rate and blood pressure again. Uh, we can also do a formal tilt table test to test for this if we need to. Uh, treatment for POTS, if that's what is determined you have, um, is mainly to stay hydrated. Uh, support stockings may help some people. And there are medicines that can slow the heart rate a little and keep the blood pressure up and may help some patients. Uh, the other thing that may be helpful for patients is as they're starting to exercise and rehabilitate to do some of those exercises in the recumbent position. So for example, instead of walking on the treadmill, perhaps a recumbent rowing machine where you're uh, laying down a little bit and less likely to have changes in the uh, heart rate. Um, there's another syndrome that's been uh, described with other illnesses that uh, I also think there is some suspicion may contribute to some patients with um, post-COVID symptoms. This is called chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, chronic, chronic fatigue syndrome is defined as having the following uh, symptoms, extreme fatigue lasting uh, at least six months. It worsens with physical or mental activity, and some patients uh, may notice a setback and feel exhausted the day after they overexert themselves. It doesn't improve with rest or sleep, and sleep is sometimes described as not refreshing and not satisfying. Many of these patients also have insomnia. And then two other symptoms, difficulty thinking or concentrating, and troubles when you stand up. Uh, for example, being lightheaded, feeling a rapid increase in heart rate, um, which gets better when you lay back down. So um, the, one of the issues with this, uh, you notice the first definition is that it has to last a six month, at least six months. So most of these patients that I'm seeing are not six months out from the onset of symptoms. And additionally, most, a lot of these patients I showed you, a third of them I see in the first four to 12 weeks, most of those are better when I contact them back later. And even the ones who had symptoms more than 12 weeks uh, a large percentage of those are better if I call them back at two or three months later. Uh, patients who are with symptoms that are lasting more than six months, are, that's a very, fortunately, I think a small group, but uh, a very troubling group of patients that can be difficult to treat. Um, if, if you do have something, this chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, there's not a lot known about this at present. Um, uh, there is a lot of active interest in studying this because it's expected there may be a fair number of patients who will develop this um, because so many patients have COVID. Uh, so we may learn more about that. But right now, there's no specific treatment uh, for chronic fatigue syndrome other than to slowly try to rehabilitate. All right, so uh, just to summarize uh, what we talked about today. Um, uh, uh, heart injury can certainly happen in COVID, but uh, at this point, the long-term consequence of that and what its effect on long-term heart function will be are uncertain. Um, I think my experience at least has been that chest pain may identify patients more likely to have heart injury and we should probably at least take a very good history and determine if the chest pain 
might be uh, cardiac chest pain. Um, shortness of breath may be due to a heart problem, but more commonly it's due to a lung problem, especially in patients who had COVID pneumonia or have pre-existing lung disease like asthma or COPD. Uh, shortness of breath with exertion also can be from deconditioning from patients who are, had prolonged illness or a uh, prolonged uh, period of not exercising. Uh, similarly, fast ha heart rate, heart pounding, and dizziness are very common reasons that patients are referred to us in the cardiology clinic. Fortunately, most of these patients, it's, there's nothing wrong with the heart itself, um, but they may have some of the syndromes like POTS or deconditioning that we talked about earlier. So exercise intolerance and fatigue are very common problems in long COVID. Many times, no cardiopulmonary, cardiopulmonary cause of these symptoms can be found. Um, it's possible that some of these uh, patients may uh, have chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, but again, uh, it's a small percentage of the overall group, and you have to have symptoms for at least six months. Um, so um, in conclusion, uh, the website uh, for the uh, webinar series is listed below. Uh, you'll be able to find my talk there, also the talk um, that um, was given uh, last week um, by uh, Dr. Overton and uh, future talks after they've been um, completed. Um, this is a list of upcoming talks. Next week, we have uh, neurologic complications, June 30th, after that, the lung, and eventually a dermatologist, uh, problems with persistent trouble with smell and taste, uh, the brain fog, GI issues, and then uh, finishing up for us, uh, Stuart Cohen talking about the role of the primary care doctor. Thank you, Dr. Um, we have received some questions from participants. So number one, is there anything to help alleviate muscle fatigue and heaviness during exercise? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. So muscle aches and, and fatigue are fairly common symptoms um, after COVID. Uh, there's a, a lot of different things that could be causing that. Um, sometimes it can just be from laying up in bed muscles weakening, uh, losing muscles from being sick and, and not exercising. Um, some patients actually can have something called myositis in the uh, acute phase of COVID, which is muscle breakdown. Um, uh, it's possible that's from direct problem with the virus, but more likely it's due to just the severe inflammatory illness that some of these patients have um, and the immune system. Um, so uh, in those, we, we can tell those things apart. We can measure, do blood work to measure enzymes and see if there's evidence of muscle breakdown. Um, assuming there's no muscle breakdown uh, active at the, at the time we're seeing the patient, uh, the treatment would be to uh, re do rehabilitation, build up your muscle mass, and slowly build up your exercise capacity. And this should get better over time. Okay, the next question is, I had a normal cardiac MRI, but still have runs of tachycardia and chest pain. Is that normal? Okay, so there's uh, several different questions in there and I'll take them uh, separately. So the first question I'm gonna address is the chest pain issue. So as indicated, chest pain uh, can be a sign of a heart problem. If you've had an, a normal MRI and somebody probably also checked your heart, your, your troponin levels, if those are normal, uh, you probably do not have active myocardial injury ongoing, causing chest pain. Now, of course, there's other causes of chest pain that have nothing to do with COVID, and it'd be important to make sure you don't have one of those things. So chest pain should be evaluated by a physician to see whether it's likely a heart cause of the chest pain. And um, if it's determined after testing and a history um, that it's not uh, a... Um, um, heart problem, then you should be free to go ahead and try to do rehabilitation and build yourself up. Uh, the fact that the heart rate with exertion was 160 and now is 130 is a good sign. It shows that you're getting better. Um, and generally, the treatment for this is to slowly but surely increase your level of activity. So start by doing whatever you can do. If that's only five or 10 minutes of exercise at a time, do that. Do that every day. And then slowly over time, every week or two, add some, you know, increase the amount of time you exercise for. Uh, your goal is to get up to where you can walk 30 to 45 minutes uh, and do that every day. 
And when you've gotten there, you can start increasing the intensity of exercise. So walk faster, walk up hills. If you used to do things like biking and jogging, you can start doing that again at that time. Um, let's see. So at what point should heart palpitations be concerning after having COVID? Yeah, so that's another great question. Um, so the concern is that in a very small group of people, heart palpitations uh, might represent an abnormal heart rhythm uh, or a dangerous heart rhythm. Uh, um, I think the experience in my clinic and generally has been that most people with feeling heart racing or pounding uh, or palpitations, when we do uh, monitoring, uh, have a rapid heart rhythm, but not an abnormal rhythm. It's just faster than usual. Um, patients that would be concerning are patients who have other cardiopulmonary symptoms. So if you're having chest pain, uh, we would be much more concerned about palpitations. Um, and we would certainly do uh, rhythm monitoring with telemetry to find out if those palpitations were from a heart rhythm problem. Um, if you're having a lot of shortness of breath, again, we would do testing to make sure the heart function is normal and that the, uh, the palpitations are, are not due to a heart rhythm problem. Um, the good news is most of the time they're not. So kind of building off the last question, what arrhythmias are you seeing post-COVID and how long before these start to subside, if at all? Yeah, so the, um, the rhythms that I've seen uh, are mostly in patients who were referred because they had chest pain and were found to have abnormalities. So those five or six patients I showed you who had something wrong on other kinds of testing. Uh, and the rhythms can be uh, um, extra beats from the bottom of the heart. These are called PVCs or premature ventricular contractions. Um, and uh, in one patient uh, I've seen uh, something called ventricular tachycardia, where there are several of those PVCs strung together. So th th this is a little more concerning situation if it's happening in the setting of seeing injury on the um, blood work or on the uh, MRI. So in that setting, uh, these rhythms would have to be taken seriously. Um, uh, patients who don't have evidence of injury, who have normal heart function, uh, we may see PVCs, but they're generally not as worrisome. So exercise is recommended to treat brain fog, but minimal exertion can see changes in an ECG. Are there cardiac symptoms to watch for? Yeah, so um, uh, in terms of exercise for um, um, neurologic symptoms like uh, brain fog or trouble concentrating and such. Uh, it's, I don't think there's probably much data whether that works or not, but it's, it seems like a reasonable thing to do if you're able to. We know in general that exercise uh, tends to help brain function. Um, uh, it's in fact one of the healthiest things you can do as you get older to uh, keep your brain healthy. Um, we also know that many patients who uh, are sick with COVID develop other problems. They, they, they can get very anxious. Um, uh, depression is not uncommon. Um, and some patients may have frank uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And certainly for anxiety and depression, there's fairly good data that uh, exercise helps. So uh, for all these reasons, I think if you can exercise and you don't find that it makes you worse, you should do that. Now, the people with chronic fatigue syndrome sometimes feel worse if they exercise too much or too vigorously. So if you're feeling worse after you exercise, um, then you need to cut back a little, but most people probably will feel better. Dr. Perry, how common is dizziness and loss of ear function with COVID long haulers? Okay, so um, dizziness and uh, inner ear problems uh, have been reported in long haulers and may not be that uncommon. Uh, so uh, there are different causes of dizziness. One is inner ear problems or vertigo. Um, and then the other is problems with um, uh, um, uh, blood pressure or heart rate, uh, the orthostatic problems we talked about before from deconditioning or POTS. Uh, so, all the, so, so the first thing would be a very careful history to find out what kind of problem you have because the treatments are quite different. Uh, vertigo is more sensation of the room spinning around and unsteadiness on your feet. 
Uh, you don't have to be standing up to have vertigo. You can have that when you're laying in bed and turn your head quickly to side to side. Whereas the dizziness from cardiovascular problems is feeling like you're going to pass out. And it's kind of a different sensation. Uh, we do have a talk, I think, from an ear, nose, and throat doctor uh, later in the series who could probably address the issue of the uh, vertigo. And we've already talked about uh, some of the treatments for orthostatic or problems when you stand up and that causing dizziness. Um, I think we've got two more questions, if that's okay. My resting heart rate is usually around 55. It's been in the mid 40s. I'm 14 months post COVID. Should I see a specialist? So, you know, for the most part, uh, the lower your heart rate is the healthier you are. So uh, usually a low heart rate is not a cause for alarm. Um, you could get an EKG and make sure it's a regular rhythm that you don't have some abnormal heart rhythm. If you're on medications, there are many medications that can also cause a slow heart rate. But if you're, uh, it's unlikely that COVID has anything to do with this. Um, so in general, uh, I don't think you need to worry about this. The other thing you can look at is whether your heart rate increases normally when you exert yourself. Um, and finally, if you're very athletic, um, it's likely due to that and uh, is a uh, benign finding. Okay, and finally, why do some heart issues, blockages, enlargements magically clear up? Yeah, so another good question. And really, it's kind of in a way, great hopeful news. The heart, like most organs in your body, has the ability to repair itself. So many of these things that we've talked about do get better over time. Uh, the uh, scarring in the heart that's been described in some patients that we don't really know if that's gonna get better. Um, most of those hearts do recover in terms of um, the contraction, the ejection fraction gets normal. Um, so whether those small areas of scar either go away or, or if they don't, whether that is um, important or dangerous, we really don't know. But um, many times we do see improvement in all these symptoms, including the heart symptoms over time. Okay, so if there are no further questions, we'll end today's Lunch and Learn. Thank you for joining us. We hope this information has been helpful and informative. To register for other post-COVID Lunch and Learns, please visit uabmedicine.org forward slash post-COVID.